be zero today. So we are now at the second talk of this last morning session. And the speaker is uh, Amir Burstein. Um, and he will tell us about inelastic decay from integrability. Uh, and I would say, just please go ahead. Okay, so you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, hi, uh, my name is Amir. I'm from the group of uh, Moshe Goldstein. So first of all, uh, again, let me thank, thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful opportunity to tell you about a recent work. So uh, this, work is going to, uh, this talk is going to have uh, two parts. Uh, in the first part, I'll tell you uh, about our motivation and about some experiments uh, from the Manachar group that we've been uh, involved with. Uh, and then I will tell you how we can uh, calculate some quantities that relate to these uh, experiments. So uh, let's begin with, um, uh, with our motivation. This is something with, that we've heard about uh, several times uh, in this week, but I'd like to rephrase it uh, in, in our terms, which relates to our work. So the question we started from is whether we can observe a significant inelastic decay uh, in a cavity QD uh, system. So for example, if you think about uh, an atom in a cavity and you have an electron uh, at the ground state, so any coming photon will excite this electron and then when this electron decays back to the ground state, it usually emits a single photon. So this corresponds to elastic scattering. Uh, and the question is, can you have inelastic scattering? For example, can you have three outgoing photons uh, whose frequencies sum up to the incoming frequency? And the answer is that this is possible in principle, but rarely observed, because uh, what uh, parameterizes the light matter coupling is the fine, stru fine structure constant alpha, which is a small number. So the probability to have such a process is very small. But this would not be the case if you have an effective uh, system in which you have uh, an effective alpha uh, on the order of one. And as we've heard, uh, we can do this by replacing the cavity we, uh, whose imp impedance is the vacuum impedance Z0, uh, we can replace this cavity by some medium that has a different impedance Z, and then we would have an effective alpha which is proportional to this impedance. And if this impedance gets close to the, res to the resistance quantum, or even exceeds it, you could expect to see uh, inelastic scattering. So we collaborated with the modern Charing group to do just that. So um, here you can see a uh, photo and a sketch of the device where we replace the uh, cavity with a transmission line and also replace the atom with an artificial atom, which is a squid. So you can see, uh, okay. So you can see your uh, antenna for spectroscopy here. It is capacitively, capacitively coupled to the transmission line, uh, and here you have your uh, your squid. Now, uh, in order to get a high impedance, uh, again, as was discussed, we use not a regular transmission line, but rather a Joseon array. So you can see the individual Joseon junctions uh, here in this photo, and the high kinetic inductance of the junction is what leads to a high. Uh, uh, impedance, which uh, would induce a high effective alpha. So we can expect to see significant inelastic scattering in the system, and in fact, this is what we saw. So uh, in our previous work, we considered a, uh, the squid in a transbond regime, and what we showed in terms of theory, we showed that uh, we can indeed get significant decay rates for uh, microwave photons in this, uh, uh, in this uh, transmission line due to their interactions with phase slips that occur in this, uh, this transbond. So we developed a theoretical framework to calculate this uh, cross-section, and actually I have a poster uh, outside about it, so if you're interested about it, I'll be uh, very happy to tell you uh, more about this. Uh, it might be useful in, in other contexts. Uh, and this theory agrees very nicely with the experiment, so this is measurements from the Manachar group, uh, which shows uh, very large uh, decay probabilities for a single photon in a single round trip in the array. So the important thing to take from this, uh, from this figure is that uh, you have very large uh, decay probabilities, uh, which is, again, something you usually do not see uh, in uh, cavity QD-like systems. And this is a rare demonstration of that. But it's not just an exotic effect. This is actually a tool that we can use to probe uh, many body physics. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about how it relates to the dissipative quantum phase transition, uh, which deals with a system very much like the one uh, uh, we discussed before, where, ha where we have some uh, job junction that is coupled to a uh, dissipative environment. So what uh, Schmidt and Brudag predicted uh, almost 40 years ago is that you would have a quantum phase transition. Uh, can you please move the, can I move it? Oh, I can move it, okay. Yeah, okay. And then I have to, oh, yeah, I think it's, it's fine, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, the prediction was that, uh, so the prediction was uh, that uh, you would have a quantum phase transition depending on the value of the normalized impedance uh, of this uh, dissipated environment. So if your normalized impedance is below one, you are in the superconducting state where uh, the cosine operator of the junction at the end 
is a relevant operator uh, and you have a relevant RG scale in the system. In that case, the phase is localized around one of the minimum of the potential and you can say that in that case, your boundary in the system will look like an inductor. Uh, on the other hand, when the normalized dependence is above one, you're in the insulin state where your cosine is an irrelevant operator, you do not have an RG scale uh, in that case. Uh, your phase can diffuse uh, all of the potential due to phase slips uh, and the boundary looks like a capacitor. So uh, that was a prediction from almost 40 years ago and uh, there have been several works that tried to observe this, uh, some of which by Hakkonen, which is here in the audience. Uh, uh, but overall, this is hard to observe this uh, transition and this is mainly due to the fact that uh, you have to apply DC uh, measurements to see this and these DC measurements might interfere with the state of the system. And in fact, um, this is part of a recent debate in, in the last two years with, again, papers by uh, some of the people uh, here in the audience. Now, our proposition to attack this problem is to use uh, the fact that the uh, system is sensitive to single photons in order to learn about its state while interfering with it in the most minimal, minimal way possible. So uh, the idea is to uh, basically measure the properties of, um, uh, of the photons, namely the decay rates and mode shifts of these single photons in order to learn about the state of the system and check whether the um, power laws and scaling laws predicted by, uh, by the theory uh, agree with the measurements. Uh, so here we choose to work in the uh, cooper perkins regime where EC is much greater than EJ. So we can look at indeed at these two uh, quantities. So um, the first thing we can look at is the uh, decay rates, which is supposed to go as a power law that depends on the impedance. And this power law diverges for impedances, normalized impedances, which are below one, which indicates that indeed you have a relevant RG scale in the system. Uh, on the other hand, this parallel does not diverge uh, for a normalized impedance above one, which indicates that the RG scale is irrelevant in that case. So unfortunately, the Melanchar group cannot measure uh, decay rates all the way down to zero frequency, but they can measure uh, intermediate frequencies, and you can use that to see the different trends. So here you can see the decay rates as a function of frequency for several values of the impedance, and you can see a different trend between impedances which are uh, above one, and this is the, uh, so, excuse me, below one, which are the uh, blue and yellow here, which trend towards divergence, uh, as opposed to the uh, purple one, for example, um, that has a different trend, and this is an impedance above one. Uh, what they can look at at zero frequency, or um, low frequency, not zero, but low frequency, uh, is mode shifts, uh, and what the mode shifts will tell us, they will tell us about the type of boundary we have in the system. So uh, we have a capacitive boundary in one end, so uh, if we are in the superconducting state and the other boundary looks like uh, an inductor, then we would expect a mode shift of uh, a phase shift of pi half. Uh, whereas if we are in the instant state, we're expecting to see a mode shift, uh, a phase shift of zero. Uh, so by looking at these uh, quantities, we can uh, learn about uh, the transition. So this is just a tease. This is work that we're uh, wrapping up right now. So uh, stay tuned uh, for the paper. Now, what I'd like to tell you about is how we can um, uh, uh, do some theory in order to uh, understand the system uh, in, uh, in, the full, uh, in the full frequency regime. So what do I mean by that? So we have this result from perturbation theory, and perturbation theory is good um, above the RG scale, so it is uh, supposed to be good for all uh, frequencies when Z is above one, but when Z is below one, uh, perturbation theory breaks down below an RG scale, but we want a solution for this, uh, for this regime. Uh, so I'd like to tell you how we can uh, achieve that, obtain the solution using the fact that our system is integrable. So this takes me to the second part of my talk, where I'll tell you how we can calculate these uh, decay rates and mode shifts for the entire frequency range. Uh, and um, so let's, let's look at our system. So our system is, again, we have some uh, Joyston junction that is coupled to a transmission line for our purposes. Uh, you can see the, the, the Lagrangian of the system here, and this system is called the uh, boundary Saigon model, which we'll also hear about uh, in the next talk. Uh, now, um, in, in terms of what uh, is, uh, interests us, so uh, let's uh, first of all consider this uh, model classically. So we can write down the differential uh, equation of motion uh, which describes uh, uh, this, uh, this system and we have some nonlinear non differential equation uh, and the uh, solutions of uh, this uh, differential equation are actually well known and they are called uh, solitons which are windings of the phase going from zero to plus or minus two pi and as you can see in uh, uh, red and blue here. Uh, and there is another type of, of uh, solution called breathers, which appears uh, only for specific values in impedance, and this is, you can see it here in the green curve. So this is uh, individual solutions of uh, this uh, equation of motion. Uh, so we can ask, uh, can we get 
solutions which are comprised of, mul comprised of multiple solitons or multiple soliton breathers. Uh, so uh, naively, it seems quite complex because this is a nonlinear differential equation, so we do not expect to have a superposition or, uh, or uh, generally you expect to have a complicated type of scatterings. But it turns out that actually scatterings in the system is uh, quite simple because this system is integrable. And this means that it has an extensive number of conservation laws that highly restrict the type of interactions that we can see in the system. So for example, if you consider the scatterings of two uh, breathers with one another that propagate along the array and meet up at some point, then when they come out of this scattering, they will, they will maintain their individual shapes, but can only gather some uh, phase shift. Now, more generally, the scattering is purely elastic in the sense that if we consider the scatterings of any two solutions uh, with one another, then we have uh, conservation of uh, the set of momenta. So it means that we do not have just conservation of P1 plus P2, but actually we have conservation of P1 and P2. So this would hold for conservation of uh, two, uh, for scatterings of two solutions and also for scatterings of N solutions with one another. Uh, so this would be the case for scatterings in the bulk and also reflections of the boundary that we have in a system. So that is the classical theory, and when we go to the quantized theory, we have to take these solutions and propose them to be field excitations, uh, and the same picture holds. So uh, we have three types of, uh, of excitations corresponding to the classical solutions in the system. Here, theta is some parameter which determines the energy and momentum. Technically, it's called the, uh, the rapidity. Uh, and again, the same picture holds. So if you consider the scatterings of N excitations with one another, then the scattering is purely elastic, so uh, the individual momenta or individual rapidities are conserved, and the only thing that, only thing that can, can happen is some uh, momentum-dependent phase shift. Uh, so this is the case for scatterings in the bulk and also for reflections uh, of the boundary. And this model has been studied extensively, and actually uh, one can obtain uh, exact expressions for uh, the scattering and reflection matrices only from the integrability of the model. So uh, there have been several works that uh, worked out these, uh, these matrices. Okay, so now we can go back to our original question. So remember that we're interested in obtaining uh, expressions for the mode shifts and decay rates of the photons, but this seems quite contradictory, contradictory to what I was just telling you about because I was telling you about a system in which scatterings are purely elastic. So the, the question is, how is it possible, or if, if it's, is it possible to have uh, inelastic scattering in such a system? And the answer is that this is possible because the scatterings are purely elastic in the basis of the solitons and breathers, but they could be inelastic in the basis of the photons because these photons depend non-linearly on the solitons and breathers. Uh, and this is underlined by the uh, special z equals half case uh, at which uh, we can actually um, uh, uh, refermionize the field. So essentially what we can do, we can uh, introduce a fermionic field that is proportional to the exponent of the bosonic field. And this fermionic field exactly uh, creates a soliton in the system. Uh, so uh, the interaction can be inelastic in the basis uh, of, the, of, the bo of, of the bosons, of the, of the photons here, uh, but it, uh, even though it is inelastic in the basis of the fermions or the solitons. Uh, so this is the case for Z equals half, where we actually have an explicit relation uh, for, uh, between the uh, bosons and the solitons and breathers. Uh, we don't have such a nice uh, relation for other bosons of Z, but the same principle holds. Now, it's not just that inelastic decay is possible on the basis of the photons, but we can actually use the uh, integrability of the model and the strong uh, analytical tools that it provides to calculate the decay rate of the photons. Uh, so generally, to calculate um, uh, decay rates, we have to calculate some sorts of uh, correlation functions. For example, we can calculate the uh, photonic propagator, which defines a reflection coefficient from which we can read off uh, the mode shifts and the decay rates. Uh, so to calculate uh, correlation functions, we can uh, use the fact that the salt and the breathers define a complete set of states, which we can insert between uh, two operators in some correlation function. And then the only thing we need to know are these uh, uh, F, F functions called form factors, which are metric elements of the operators between the vacuum state and the state of uh, N excitations of N salt and breathers. And these uh, form factors, same as for the scattering of reflection matrices, these form factors are well known uh, for this uh, boundary cycle model and can be derived exactly only from the integrability of the model. So uh, now we have everything we need to calculate uh, the decay rates, so we can now go to our results. So uh, starting from the total decay rate, so as I said, this can be obtained by calculating a uh, photonic propagator. Uh, and there is some heavy lifting to do here in order to calculate this, uh, these integrals, so I'm not going into, into the details, but uh, in principle this uh, can be done and, and we did this. So uh, what we get is this result. So this shows you the decay rate as a function of frequency uh, in log-log scale 
uh, for several values of the impedance. And you can see that the exact solution, which is uh, here in solid lines, uh, agrees very nicely with perturbation theory uh, for frequencies above the RD scale. We get the same parallel uh, that we had from the perturbation theory. Uh, and perturbation theory is no longer valid below the RD scale, so we need the exact solution to complete the picture and get this uh, uh, impedance independent parallel uh, that shows that the K rate goes to zero uh, uh, at, at low frequencies. Now we can actually go uh, one step further than that and calculate not only the total decay rate, which tells us the rate at which a frequency omega k splits to any combination of frequencies, we can actually also calculate the decay spectrum, which tells the rate at which a frequency omega k splits to a specific omega k prime plus some other frequencies to conserve energy. Uh, and uh, this decay spectrum obeys a sum rule which relates it to the total decay rate. Uh, it is given by a three-point correlation function, so that is slightly more involved work, which is uh, still, uh, we're still uh, in progress. This is something we're wrapping up. Uh, for now, we can show the result for z equals half, where we can actually obtain a closed exact expression uh, for this decay spectrum. Uh, and the other values are now uh, uh, in progress. Okay, so allow me to briefly conclude. So I told you um, how uh, single photon splitting is, is possible in, in a circuit QD environment and how it can be used to observe uh, many body physics and specifically uh, the uh, schmidt goulart transition by measuring the decay rates and mode shifts uh, of the photons. Uh, and I told you how uh, even though a model is integrable and therefore the scatterings are uh, purely elastic, it is still possible to get elastic uh, scattering in the base of the photons and we can use the integrability to obtain an exact expressions for these uh, decay rates. So these are two works that we're wrapping up right now, so stay tuned uh, for the papers uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, questions? On, on slide six, you had this division between insulator and superconductor. So in my view, the definition in the insulating state that it's like a capacity boundary condition, it's not really accurate because I mean, you can have very infrequent phase slips. So basically it's still inductor and only infrequently phase slips. So I think this, for this you need like a running phase completely, but it's, it's not needed for the insulating state. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understood, I, I mean, okay, when, when, okay, when. So the um, question is whether I think the capacitance is the, the right model for the insulating state, is that the? Yeah, okay. Um, Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the capacitor does not take into account uh, the, uh, the the phase slips. That's that's correct. Um, but uh, I mean, what? So the fact that you have phase slip means you have uh, um, means you have uh, uh, a well-defined charge, right? So if you have a well-defined charge, so we can. I mean, if I understand the theorist correctly, then if you have one phase slip in one day, then it's an insulator, basically. Uh, well, um, I mean, okay, so, so if, if you think about it as, as a capacitive uh, uh, element, so, so this means you have localized charge, right? So, so you have localized Cooper pairs. Uh, so this would co correspond to, fa to, to, a f to a phase which is not well-defined, right? Uh, so uh, I, I think I it think, does I think this might account. be a bit more technical discussion. I think it all goes back to time scales, and um, the question okay. is what you call an insulator. Yes, thanks for the nice talk. I would have a more uh, experiment-oriented uh, question. Uh, in your uh, second part, in this, uh, whenever you use integrability, how much of the, in, do, what, what is the assumption of the, of the spectral function of the bath? Can you really take into account the, I don't know, the plasma frequency, as, as we call it, or are you assuming a simple ohmic bath, or is it, bit, yeah. can you, mm -hmm. yeah, can you okay. comment on that? Yeah, okay, so thank you for the question. This is, this is a good question. So uh, first of all, uh, yeah, okay, so um, we're working in, in the Cooper Perkins regime and this, this solution is exact in the limit where EC is, is, is infinity. So we completely eliminate the, yeah, so. Now you still have some, some ba final bandwidth, you still have some, uh, uh, um, uh, some bandwidth to, to your system and um, we can extract this bandwidth, so, so the only, the only energy scale we have in this uh, solution from the integrability is uh, the RD scale. 
Uh, and the algae scale um, relates to the, to the bandwidth, so your, your EJ star is EJ over, over the bandwidth, right? Um, so you can extract it um, from, um, so, so basically you need the, the, the bandwidth in order to calculate this algae scale to, to put it into the, to the calculation. Uh, so you can extract it from perturbation theory, you can, what you can do, you can, uh, and in fact you need to extract it, so um, what you can do, you can uh, uh, compare your exact solution with your perturbative solution and then extract the, um, uh, find what, what is this, uh, what is this, so here you have some coefficient which tells you exactly what you need to put in to, to account for this finite bandwidth and you can find this coefficient from this, uh, from this uh, um, comparison, from comparing the exact solution to the perturbative solution. So uh, you, 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 get, you, you get directly the parallel from uh, the exact solution but you don't get, you don't know where to put it, it can be uh, shifted up or down, and what tells you where to put it is exactly this bandwidth. Uh, now, one thing that is not taken into account here is temperature. This solution is for zero, zero temperature. That's also uh, something we should note. Uh, we're looking into some ways to um, to extend this to to non-zero to yeah to finite uh, temperature. You can do this uh, using uh, thermodynamical beta ansatz, um, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. Other questions? I think uh, if not, then we want to thank the speaker once more. <laughs>